Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is JP from Out of This World. Um, today I'm just gonna, after a while, just gonna post this video. It's a little bit about um, what can you do with Bifrost for Maya. So how can you take advantage of all the templates that we've included in this version of Bifrost for Maya? Um, if you don't know what Bifrost for Maya is, I would encourage you to uh, go into the area and read a little bit about Autodesk uh, Bifrost for Maya, but it's not just a simulation tool. It's a lot more than that. Uh, in fact, you can do um, tons of things like scattering, create fibers, cloth simulations, and a lot more, even deformers and read characters. So there's kind of a uh, tiny series of tutorials that was, were made by uh, Stephen Rosell from my old oh, Maya, a colleague of mine here at Autodesk. Uh, so I encourage you also to just go and watch them all before you do this tutorial. Um, so now let's continue to this. So where does Bifrost exist instead of Maya? It's basically a graph. So all you need to do is just click in there and you will find uh, Bifrost right in here. So everything happens inside of this Bifrost graph. So as I mentioned before, you have we have a lot of um, different templates that we've included in this version. So, and you can see they're categorized by smoke, fire, particles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in today's tutorial, I'm just going to show you how to take advantage of the standard explosion. Um, these are called compounds. So now we're going to take this particular compound into the scene. But before we do, um, I want to show you how to how to take a how to create your own emitter basically because this is just going to show, uh, give you a sphere emitter which is created inside of bifrost um, so what i want to do is just create a sphere so in in this particular case i want to do kind of a nice explosion the going from say point a to point b so i'm going to take uh, this sphere and i'm going to animate it say a key from frame one to frame uh, five, so it's going to be quite quick. And say now, let's take that to minus ten. But I also want to uh, add a little bit of a deformation to it, so it adds a little bit more detail to that explosion. So I'm going to add a texture um, deformer in this case. So, and I want to make sure that the in direction, instead of using the handle, I'm going to be using normal. So Basically, I want to take the point position, and I want, and I want to make sure that also Bifrost takes that and average it when it's creating that um, that effect. So now all I want to do is, is connect a noise, um, a fractal noise there, and now you see I have that. But it's, in order for this to kind of do uh, what I want, it needs to be animated over time. So as you can see, if I move it, now when when I emit particles or um, from this emitter it's going to create variation so it's a little bit of uh, a fake way to do an extra turbulence um, to to this explosion so now what i want to do is i want to create an expression into the time saying equals time multiply that by four so it moves a little bit fast and now if i move uh, you see oh, let's hit actually play so we see how fast it's moving it's actually moving quite fast so that's good that's, that's what we want actually. So another thing that I want to do is just take the amplitude and let's start from zero. So it's zero amplitude. So I'm going to create a key there. And over time, I'm going to add that amplitude and I'm going to set that to one. Uh, now set a key. And for frame six, I'm going to go into channel and I can either set this into the Bifrost graph or I can do it here. So I like to do it here. So, but it's whatever you want to do, it's up to you. So in this case, I want to take the um, the visibility on this particular object here, and I want to set a key on frame uh, six. Yeah, I want to key select that. I'm going to frame seven now, and I'm going to set the visibility back to zero. Uh, you can either type one to have the visibility on, or zero for the visibility to be off, or you can type off as well, whatever you want. So that's it. So now that I have this, I want to come back to my Bifrost browser and I want to import that graph into Bifrost. So now what I've, once I've done that, I'm uh, just going to maximize this window so you see what's going on. Basically, Bifrost already gave me 
all the compounds, all the connections that I need in order to have an explosion set up. Uh, and we can go through all of them. So now, as you, as you may see, very first thing that is connected uh, is the very temperature. So if I come in here, as you see, there's a little text that says temperature will produce a less uniform blast upon ignition. Make sure ignition temperature on the fuel node is within the variation range. Um, so that's, that's here. That's all you need to know. Um, so basically, you have a mean and max, you have a bias, um, and now you can you can change this stuff in order to produce a different type of blast. Now you have a source air, and the source air basically gives you a star and end frame. In this case, end frame set to 12. Uh, so whenever that sphere stops, uh, it's not going to emit more any more fuel. But you can change it here. You can just leave it. Doesn't really matter. But you can anyway specified it in here where where you want that simulation to end uh, pretty much then you have a resolution mode which can be uh, relative or absolute to the model uh, you have a geo detail size uh, and a bunch of other things um, now you have in, in this one here you have the source fuel so in in Bifrost for Maya, we have a new solver added, which is a combustion solver, which works on real physics, pretty much. Um, as you can see here, it says it's just the bond rate and fuel type to produce a variety of blasts. So if you want to change the way this looks, you see you have a fuel type here. You can change that from methane to butane or whatever. There's a lot of them there. You can try them all. You can change the burn rate and you can see what type of results you get. So you get a lot of really neat results by just changing this stuff. Then connect it to the simulate, simulate aero bot, not doing anything, is this guy here. So we already have a collider connected there, but it's not really colliding to anything. So for in order to collide to something, you need to bring in the geometry and connect it to this input, particularly here. So I'm going to show you how to do that in a bit, but I want to go through all the rest of them um, graphs here or nodes. So basically, the simulated arrow is just a solver, so there's nothing there really. Um, let's go back to, into the combustion settings. You will see you have a different different type of settings that you can also change in here. Um, then you have aero solver settings where you can change buoyancy by default set to point and minus 9.81, which is the gravity um, values basically. Then you have like uh, velocity smoothness, styles, ambient temperature. So obviously everything is going to change dependently on the ambient temperature. So temp room temperature is always set to say 20 degrees. Uh, so if it was in a much hotter room, obviously everything will dissipate a lot faster because it's a lack of air. So that's all you need to know in this case. Now we have explosion material already uh, connected and assigned it. So it's back to the output. So again, if you if you feel a little bit confused, I will encourage you just to go back and watch Stephen Rosell's videos. And remember, there's a lot of really neat information about Bifrost already out there. There's even a masterclass in YouTube you can find in our learning channel regarding how this solver works entirely. So now, now that I have done this, all I want to do, uh, so in order to make my own explosion, is just basically take this guy here, delete it entirely, and I want to bring in my emitter, which is this guy here, uh, sphere one. So in order for me to take it into the Bifrost world, all I need to do is just middle click mouse and drag, hold, and put it in here. Just pretty much as easy as that. Now that I have done that, and just so you can see what's going on, I'm just going to dock it, uh, dock this window over here, um, basically. All right. So now all I need to do is connect the mesh output into the geometry input here. That's all I need to do. So there's one thing you could do now. You can either start seeing your simulation uh, and by just hitting play here. As you can see, you will start to see something going on. So that's my simulation already started. Uh, but basically, because it takes a little bit of time to simulate, I want to stop this. This Right, I'm just going to hard stop it right now. Um, and what I really want to do is just to add an open VDB write. So whenever this is ready, I can read the open VDB file and, and create a play blast so I can see the fi final result completely. All right, so like I was saying before, all, I, all we need to do now is just to basically to accelerate things or speed up things a little bit. It's just going to create a write open VDB node. So if you type right here, uh, you will find it a little bit faster. 
uh, in this little window here, but you can also, you know, investigate where it lives. So in this case, it will be a file um, operation. So you say it's geometry, you see we have all, of, all the possible ones here. So I'm just going to take this one here, open BDV, and that creates this particular node, which gives me a lot of inputs and outputs. Um, as you might see, you have file name, directory, frame, etc. It seems like an easy uh, thinking uh, that this is going to generate a sequence, but not really. So if you want to generate a sequence, you have to you have to create a time node, because otherwise it's just going to give you one frame. So you create a time node, but in this case, um, there's an extra operation that we need to do. So that operation is going to be a conversion from an integer. So basically, we need to convert this to an integer. All right, so we need to connect the frame output into the from input uh, right here. So that's just so Maya or the OpenVDV sequence knows that that's going to be frame one, frame two, frame three, etc., etc. Otherwise, it's going to evaluate time, which is a different type of um, a number in this case. So I'm just going to add this into the frame. Now I'm all set. So that, that's all I need to do for the moment. And I'm, in the out volumes, um, you want to connect that in here. So once that's connected, so all we need to do is just add a name. So in this, in this case, it's going to call explosion, add a dot, and three numerals. So Maya knows the, the how many digits it needs to input. It could be two, three, whatever you want. And then dot VDB. And it specifies a directory here. Um, so it's as easy as just finding your directory. In this case, uh, I've already created the, the, the VDB sequence. So I'm just going to copy this just to show you. I'm going to paste it in here. And I also want to make sure that I'm not checking in the override uh, option. So I want to make sure that I skip that. Because if I say you're going to be doing this overnight, you just, just want to make sure that Maya is not going to constantly override. So in, in that, in the case that you forget, Maya by default will have a continuous loop set here. So you can either turn that off and don't care, or just make sure that you don't have any loop set in here. Basically, just turn that off. Uh, but for, for for safety reasons, I just rather just to uncheck that. So now I'm, I'm now that I have this, all I need to do is just hit play. Let it run through the simulation, which is going to take a little bit of time. And once this is finished, all I need to do in this case, there's two things you can do. You could bring it in into a new scene, but that means you're going to lose your material, which is pretty, pretty neat and nice. Um, or just basically save it with a different name, uh, the Maya file, and just delete all these graphs here, pretty much. That's it. So now I have, I want to keep my material in the scene. I don't really need it in the Bifus graph because that actually exists in here. And it was brought in the same fashion that I brought in the sphere uh, previously. So now I'm keeping only the right BDB just so I can copy this stuff here. So I'm just going to type now um, a read, open BDB. And all I want to do is basically copy this guy here, take this guy. Um, I want to also copy this in here and the extension, which is, uh, sorry, the, the directory, which is this other one here. And then I'm all set. Now I can basically delete the right and I can now connect volumes and create a new volumes output. So now that I've done that, I can even hide my my emitter and I can start to see what's going on. So if I hit play now, we're going to start to see something. Okay, so something's happening, but uh, if, you might, if you can notice, there's no um, connections made on the shader. So all I need to do is reconnect the shader. So that's going to stop the timeline. Okay, so the output here is this one here, Bifrost 3. It's just the latest output, so it's BIF 3. So now all I need to do, I'm uh, just going to get rid of that, is connect a material, which is the one that 
we have before. So standard material, explosion material, da -de da So that's it. Now I got my, my explosion material added to this. And obviously now, because this is reading from an open VDV sequence, it's going to be a lot faster to generate a play blast, uh, which otherwise you couldn't have done. So in this case, just go ahead and create your play blast. And once this is finished, you can see the results, which I already have here. All right. I got the explosion. And that's it. So there's a lot of things that you can do with this. Um, you can try different setups. Maybe you can create a ring uh, that expands using torus or whatever you want and see, you know, different results out of this. As you can see, very straightforward to set up and you can get super realistic results in no time.